Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Douglas, and welcome to our webinar here this afternoon covering uh, early detection of industrial fires. Leading us today is uh, Charles Simic from Honeywell. Uh, Charles has been in the industry for over 25 years. He's had just about every position imaginable from uh, technician, technical writer, he's been on the sales side, business development, and uh, product specialist side. And uh, spent 11 years with Fire Century, um, and, and Honeywell recently purchased Fire Century, uh, it was probably, what, about a year, year and a half ago? Three years ago. And two years ago, okay. Well, time flies. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so he'll be leading us today. Um, we will be recording this webinar, so if you want to pass it on to a coworker at a later time, you can do that. We'll also make the slide deck available. Um, we'll have that up on our website at Reiko.com, our training page. If uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions at all, we're going to try to address those at the end. Uh, you'll notice on the right-hand side of your screen, a go to webinar. There's a little section that says questions. Um, so as they pop up, uh, you know, please feel free to uh, kick those our way, and uh, and we'll get to them uh, as quickly as we can. Um, with that said, Charles, I'm going to send it over to you and uh, go from there. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, as Tom said, I'm Charles Simic, and I, I'm I'm with Honeywell Analytics. Uh, doing the flame presentation today for you. Uh, we're going to do a, a bit of a technology review, um, or for you guys it would be a preview, and then we're going to go over the um, products, and then we're going to talk about something, uh, one of the unique features that uh, Honeywell offers is called Fire Pick and Event Log, and it's a way of uh, accessing uh, post-alarm data. Um, it, it gives you pre-alarm data, for post-event analysis, uh, and I'll go more into that later when we get to it. It'll all be clear at the end. So, <clears throat> when we look at um, fires, and I'm using gasoline as a, as a typical fire here, um, this is what we would call a classic hydrocarbon fire model. And down on the bottom, what we have is uh, I, I've broken it up into a color bands of different. Uh, regions on the uh, electro-optical spectrum. That's the energy that we look at. It's called light. Light, uh, the green portion that you see, is, is that's the portion of energy that we can see with our human eyes. That's the visible portion. The portion that's to the left of that, the purple, would be the ultraviolet region. Um, the yellow region is what's known as near-infrared because it's very close to the visible spectrum. And then we have short wave infrared, which would be the orange section. We have mid wave infrared, which is where most conventional detectors uh, do their detection with infrared detectors. Um, that's the red section. And then finally, the darker section off to the right is called long wave infrared. When you burn uh, a product like gasoline, you end up creating byproducts of combustion. These byproducts are always formed as hot gases, and as hot gases, they emit energy in the ultraviolet, the visible, and the infrared spectrum. So when we combust uh, gasoline, some of the more popular byproducts are H2O, which is water vapor, forms as a hot gas, and so it has an emission uh, right around 2.4, 2.7 microns. Um, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, has a very identifying marker at 4.3 micron wavelengths. And then we can move down the line to CO, and then of course anytime you burn anything in our atmosphere, you're going to have oxides of nitrogen. And so I list nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and uh, the oxides of nitrogen off to the right there. So this is what a typical gasoline fire, work, fire looks like, and it's, it's uh, what we would consider to be a, a hydrocarbon fire model. So when we look at the hydrocarbon fire model and we look at how Honeywell detects fire with its UVIR and its triple IR versus what the conventional uh, detectors are, are using, 
uh, we can see that Honeywell looks at a lot more information than a conventional IR detector does. Um, a conventional UV and IR detector, everyone uses that uses UV do, does the same thing. They all use the same um, same product to detect that or same sensor to detect that region. Everyone is different with the way they handle infrared, and we're markedly marketably different than just about the rest of the entire industry. Okay, we're looking at a broad spectrum of energy that includes visible, visible near infrared, and this section we call wideband IR, the orange section. Um, if you look at the conventional UV IR detector, they they monitor the same UV region that we do, but they have a very thin line that's centered right on that CO2 spike that we spoke about on the previous slide. Okay. So that CO2 spike is a very, uh, very solid marker for hydrocarbon fires, and, and, and it's a very good, it's a very reliable marker. Uh, when we move down to the triple IR detector, you can see there again we're covering more, more data. We, we've, we've broken the wideband up into two separate wideband regions. We're covering the same nearband and the same visible region, although with triple IR we don't cover UV because that's done with the UV IR. Uh, the conventional manufacturers uh, use three sensors that cover three separate bands also. And what they're doing is, is, is they have their primary detection band that's set right at the CO2 marker. And then they're looking at the low sides of, of that peak value. And what they're doing is that they're turning the gain up on their sensor and they're using the low sides to protect the integrity of that band. If you have um, the one that's to the left would be at or near 3.8 microns. If you have that 3.8 energy elevated as high as the 4.3, that really doesn't fit the hydrocarbon fire model. And so they can reject that. They can say that's not a real fire because hydrocarbon fire models say that 3.8 energy is about one fifth of what the what the real fire energy is, and that's the same with the 5.2 on the other side. Okay, um, Honeywell looks at a broad spectrum of energy, and so uh, the concept is is the more data that you have about the fire, the more intelligent your decision making is with re relation to that energy that you're looking at, as to whether that's a real fire that we can alarm to or if it's a, a non-fire event that we need to reject. Okay, so the idea is with more energy we have a better intelligent decision-making process. With the UVIR on top we're looking at about 85 percent of the fire's infrared energy. Uh, with the triple IR on the bottom we're looking at about 90 percent of the energy. Typically they look at about one percent or less of the energy of a, a, in the infrared spectrum. Now, when we look at a spectral image of what a hydrogen fire looks like, it's a little bit different, okay? It has the H2O as one of its byproducts of combustion, but not a lot elsewhere. And so if we take and we compare this, <coughs> this type of fire, um, you can see with our UVIR, we're still getting a bit of the UV, as is the, as is the conventional detector. But we're also the, we're grabbing the bulk of the hydrogen's energy still in the orange range. When we go to, to, to the conventional detector, the 4.3 is very low. They're not going to respond to this hydrogen fire because they're just not going to see it. They don't have enough 4.3 micron energy to be able to say that reliably that this is a fire. Again, on the triple IR side, we're looking at even more of the fire's energy. Um, but the triple IR detector, there's not much that distinguishes those three levels. And so they're, they're typically inherently with the technologies that the conventional manufacturers use. They're going to be blind to the non-hydrocarbon fire. They're not going to see these images at all. So <clears throat> when we talk about the technology that we use, on the triple IR plus, we looked at a visible region. We also looked at the near infrared, and then we have two separate widebands that we look at. When we talk about our UV IR, it's actually a UV dual IR, we look at ultraviolet energy, we look at visible energy, we also look at the near infrared, and we have a, a wideband infrared section. 
and that's kind of what I've tried to list here is this these these are the the areas of energy that we're looking at and and, it, and they're all broad spectrum it's not narrow band narrow narrow uh, regions they're they're very broad bands of energy that we look at we come to some of our older products the SS2 the SS3 and the SS4 we still use the wideband IR technology and I've, I've included the gasoline and the hydrogen fire models here so that you can you can see uh, the UV the visible and the wideband the wideband actually overlaps the uh, the near infrared because we didn't distinguish back then between the two um, but you can see we're still looking at the bulk of the energy that comes from a fire in both of these cases in both the hydrocarbon and the non hydrocarbon model uh, moving down we look at the FS 10 detector which this is the product that we use for the finishing industry uh, it's the same story we're looking at the bulk of the information that comes from the fire uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different than the SS2 the wideband isn't as wide uh, but uh, we still look at a lot of the uh, a lot of the energy a lot of the information that comes off of that fire then of course we have our semiconductor detector and this is designed for wet applications um, uh, typically a wet bench or a wet tool but there again we're looking at uh, a broad spectrum of energy um, um, both the hydro hydrocarbon and the non hydrocarbon region and that's that's kind of the portfolio of products that we have to look at the FS 24x which is our triple IR the FS 20x which is our UV dual IR uh, the SS2, the SS3, and the SS4 are um, UV and IR, plus they incorporate visible energy. Uh, the FS10 and the FS7 are both dual IR detectors that look at visible energy also. And so those are the technologies that we use on the products. Uh, the benefit of the wideband IR is that we can alarm to all fires all the time, but that's not the only bonus that we gain. Because the the actual sensors that we use are military grade sensors uh, we tend to operate at higher operating temperatures so we can see uh, fires reliably with higher temperature applications uh, one, another benefit of wideband IR is that uh, environmental conditions such as fog mist and steam don't affect us as much as it does a very very narrow band uh, detector uh, that information gets blocked very easily uh, by a detector that's looking for a very skinny line of emission. Um, I, I have a footnote down here with environmental conditions, and that's that UV detectors, the UV portion of of the UVIR detector, is going to have a problem in the presence of fog, steam, and mist because it's looking at shorter wavelengths than what the human eye can see, and so those shorter wavelengths are also a block easier. Um, but the IR as far as the broadband IR that wideband IR we're getting enough information that comes through that fog steam and mist that we can still reliably detect fires <clears throat> I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the products um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go through each product family one by one um, the FSX products are made up of, of two technologies the dual IR uh, UV and this which is the FS 20x that's shown on the left there and then we have the FS 24x which is our triple IR detector um, the back of the module the detector module if I take the the housing off and pull the actual detector module out I have my connections and my switch selectable options on the back are identical for both detectors the relay outputs and the power the communication all of the switch selectable options are identical for both of these detectors they were built on a common platform uh, and the idea was uh, to make it easier for installers to just be able to switch from one technology to the other so uh, the top uh, switch which is a 10 position dip switch we use for a digital address the first three switches are reserved for factory use and so the last four are actually the ones last sorry last seven four through ten are the ones that we use for the digital address seven bit digital addressing gives us hundred and twenty eight different unique addresses um, the middle switch which is which is an eight position dip switch is used to configure the detector uh, latching non-latching relays do we want them to be normally energized or normally de-energized 
do we want our verification time to be five seconds or ten seconds? Um, you know, stuff. What do we want the sensitivity? You know, do we want the long range? Do we want the mid one of the mid ranges, or or do we need a short range? So, and then the last switch is a rotary switch, and it's used to select the mode or the protocol for the RS-485 and whether or not we're going to sync or source our current for the 4 to 20 milliamp output. So here's here's a block or kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a, a flowing chart of how we provide 24 volts in and then the outputs are we have SP, ST contacts for fault, uh, single pole double throw contacts for alarm and auxiliary. Uh, the current signal, and again, it can be sourcing or syncing, and then we provide uh, a communications, uh, either RS-45, Firebus 2 is our proprietary protocol, or, or Modbus, Modbus RTU. Uh, there is an option to add a heart module, and you'll end up with heart over 4 to 20 with either one of these devices. Uh, physically or mechanically, uh, we offer 3 quarter NPT or M25 conduit entries, uh, and there's two of them. Um, you can get the detector either in copper-free aluminum or 316 stainless. Um, on the FS20X, we use a quartz window because we, we need to pass that UV energy to the detector. Uh, on the FS24X, we have to use a sapphire window because we need the the extremely longer wavelengths of the uh, of the infrared region. Then on the back, uh, this kind of details the uh, the switch selections that I've kind of gone through already. Uh, seven bit addressing, latching or non latching, energized or de energized for the alarm relay. Uh, the same for the auxiliary relay. Plus we can set a verification time. Uh, the fault relay we can set either as normally energized or normally de-energized. Um, we could set the sensitivity, and then all of, also we can set the communications mode. Hard is not listed on this particular slide because it is an add-on feature. It's a, uh, it's a it's a little board that adds to the bottom of this module, and it actually uses up the the J1 connectors, and and you can access the the heart and the 4 to 20 through the J1 connector. This is the, the older generation of product, the SS2. This is a very, um, very first um, offering that we had for the oil and gas industry that was explosion proof. Um, it uses a quartz window because of the UV. Uh, it operates on 24 volts DC. Again, uh, the same detector options, either aluminum or stainless, three-quarter NPT or M25 conduit entries. It does have one fault relay, single pole double throw, and one fire relay, single pole double throw. And it uses uh, the previous generation of Firebus 1 uh, protocol. So there's only four, uh, three connectors on this. Uh, there's only 12 connection points on this device. Um, there is no... Um, through the window optical self-test with this detector. And there are no switch selectable options as there are with the uh, FSX series. So we have a, uh, a, a non-explosion proof detector, the only one in our portfolio. It's the SS3. And it uses a small quartz window where the, where the ultraviolet photo tube is. Uh, it's ABS plastic is the construction material. Uh, it's only a NEMO 1 enclosure. So please don't use it outdoors. It's primarily an indoor detector. Uh, it also runs off of 24 volts DC. It has one fire relay in it, and I, I show the diagram of, up, of the fire relay up, up above. And then it also allows you to connect to the RS-45 uh, so that you can access uh, Firebus 1. Uh, Firebus is, is used to download uh, fire picks, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. That brings us to the SS4. This is um, probably the most popular detector uh, since Fire Century was established in 1981. Uh, we have over 100,000 of these in, in installed installations all over the world. Uh, we have a product variation known as the AUV2, and it's a UV-only detector, uh, primarily used for indoor 
uh, applications because when you put it outdoors, uh, you're exposing it to, to things like lightning and arc welding, and that's going to trip the UV phototubes, and uh, it'll go into alarm uh, prematurely. But again, it's the, the construction is the same as the SS2. Um, we provide fire fault and something we call verify relay. Um, if, you, if, if we have a fire event that occurs and you set a verify time for the verify relay, uh, when that time is reached, dur during, during the time between a fire is declared and during the time until that verify time is reached, we're checking to see if that fire is still burning. If that fire goes out at any point, we drop off. We don't we don't activate our verify output. But if that fire burns through the uh, period of time of the verify time, then we actually activate that second output. The reason we have this is because um, sometimes my detector is quick enough to pick up a flash fire, and so if it if it picks that flash fire up, it's, it's a fire by definition that's burnt itself out. It's consumed all of the fuel. We want to know about it, and so we have an alarm point that's set uh, that, that will activate. Um, but you don't necessarily want to suppress that fire because it's already put itself out. And so that's why if you take executive action, you should always connect to the verify relay. And it's the verify relay that tells you, okay, you've had a fire, and it's been burning for a little while now, so you need to suppress it. And then, of course, we have uh, the Firebus 1 on, on the RS-45, same as the, the SS-3 and the SS-2, it's the older one. Uh, we have, at the time of this detector's development, it just came out with the relays. And so we developed an optional 4 to 20 milliamp card that you could uh, use. It, unfortunately, it takes up the fault and the fire contacts because we use those to actually generate the, the zero milliamp for fault and the 20 milliamp signal for fire. And then later on we developed a, a, a heart board that actually mounts to the very bottom. Um, it doesn't take up any of the relay spaces. It accesses the fire bus one signal and makes the determination based off of the information that's on there. So you get heart over 4 to 20 plus you keep your or three fault fire and verify relays intact. And this, this, this detector does have a through the lens self check and it does have switch selectable options. Okay, so the bottom of the board looks like this. It's a little more uh, populated. Uh, we have redundant connections for power and RS-45. And then we have uh, SPD contacts, single pole double throw contacts for, for fault fire and verified fire relay. Okay. And then um, the user selectable options are found on a dip switch on the middle board. The middle board's our control board. Um, and those are the options that you can either set the alarm relays for latching or non-latching. Um, you can same with the verify. Uh, you can set a verify time anywhere between 0 and 30 seconds or you can just have that output disabled. Uh, you can set the sensitivity of the detector. Um, you can also set the self-test frequency of on the UV channel. And the reason you do that is because the, the UV source lamp is kind of the weak link in the chain for this particular device um, in, in that it, it, it has, it's a life-limited uh, product. And so if you set it for once every 30 minutes, you're actually increasing the life of the, of the um, of the source lamp. Now, going back to the previous slide, I don't know if I can draw on this. This brass box here, whoops, page up. This brass box here that's held on by this clip and that screw, that screw, that box actually pulls out of my board set. If I go back even to here, it's the same brass box that's here, right? Well, there's a tube. This brass tube it turns into this darker tube up here. That's where the source lamp is. And you can actually undo the clip here and pull that whole assembly out and replace it with another one. So in recognizing that the source lamp is, is the weak component and, and they last uh, five, six years, uh, you, this is a, 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 an item that you can actually stock on the shelf. 
And that brings us to the FS10R, which is, this is our finishing product. Uh, I have a, a picture of the, the connector on the back there, and it's already got its label and everything on it, uh, so you can tell which, which connectors are which. Um, they're <coughs> It's got, the old, it's got the old Fire Sentry address in California. Uh, this product is now currently built in Lincolnshire, though. So uh, it runs off of 24 volts. We use a glass window here because we're not so concerned with ultraviolet energy, and we're not so concerned with those super long infrared wavelengths, so we can get away with glass. Uh, the relay contacts, uh, we combine two, two different outputs onto a single relay. Uh, it's called FEW and ALERT. FEW stands for Fire Early Warning, um, and then the alert is, is another function. The alert is your indication that you've got a fireball event that's occurred. If you think about a, a finishing uh, detector and what application it's going to be used for, think of a liquid paint spray booth or an electro pack powder, electrostatic powder coating booth. When those materials are actually aspirated in the booth uh, and coating, whatever product that they're coating. If you have an electrostatic discharge, you can ignite that powder or that paint. You end up creating a, a, a big fireball that burns from one end of the booth to the other. Uh, and this, and it happens very, very quickly. And that's what that relay, that fire early warning, that alert relay is designed to pick up uh, within three tenths of a second. Uh, the alarm relay is there to let you know, hey, uh, you had an event and it's still going on, much like that verification relay. So the fire early warning and the alert are very, very quick responders to fire, but the alarm relay says, hey, something on the booth has caught fire, and so you need to put it out. Um, and again, we're using a newer protocol called Firebus 2, and that's the same protocol that we actually use on our FS24X and our FS20X. Uh, and it allows us uh, faster uh, communication time. And that's the FS10R. And that brings us to our semiconductor sensor, which is our FS2173-RP, which is relays and pigtail. I don't show the pigtail here. The pigtail is a 14 conductor cable that you can access power, RS45, fault alert, and alarm relays on. Okay. So the housing is made of polypropylene because we don't want anything sticking to it and we don't want anything corroding it. When you think about a semiconductor application, it's one that's going to go into a wet bench where a wafer manufacturer has a proprietary chemical that he uses to etch and bathe his wafer. Um, these are very, very uh, dangerous for uh, metal components. Uh, and so what we do is we take the entire PC board and we put it behind a polypropylene housing and we use a Teflon connector uh, to, con to connect the cable to the, uh, to the housing. Uh, the cable that actually gets connected to this housing has a Teflon sleeve on it so that we're maintaining the leak-proof integrity of the housing. And you'd run that cable and that sleeve all the way outside of the, uh, the bulkhead of the, what's called the plenum, plenum area of the, uh, of the wet bench. Excuse me. So to make a good, a good seal, we use an O-ring between our Teflon connector and our uh, detector housing. Um, the material that that O-ring is is either going to be Viton or CalRES. Um, in the early days, it was CalRES or Viton all the time, and we only used the CalRES occasionally uh, when uh, manufacturers come out with very new and aggressive uh, liquids that, that they use for their etchings and their bathings, um, it, it tend to, tended to uh, deteriorate the Viton O-ring. And so uh, for a little bit more money, we, we put in the CalRES O-ring, and um, that seems to be very corrosion resistant to, to all forms of the semiconductor manufacturers' proprietary soups that they cook up. So, and that's the FS2173-2RP detector. And then, and like I said, that mounts inside of a, a of a wet chemical station. 
And so we have a variety of detector accessories. Uh, we have air shields, uh, swivel mounts, sun shades and test lamps and looks like field of view restrictors. So let's let's take a look at those. So uh, test lamps. When we talk about test lamps, these are external sources that are used to trip the detector. Um, so for our um, SS2, SS4, and FSX detectors, a lot of times those go into what are what are termed hazardous area locations. And so we need a hazardous area certification for the test lamp that we take into those areas to test the detectors. And so the TL2055 is an explosion proof test lamp that you can use um, within 25 feet of the, either the FS24X or the FS20X and it will trip that device. If those detectors are indoors, you can go out to 35, sometimes 40 feet with that test lamp. Um, the TL1055 has the exact same performance as the TL2055, except that it is not rated for hazardous areas. And so you can only use it in safe areas. You can't take that into a, a class one div one location uh, and expect it not to be a, a hazard for that area. Um, the FT2145 is, is similar to the TL2055, but it's specifically designed uh, for the SS2, SS3, and SS4. Uh, the SS2 and the SS4 have hazardous area certification, but that SS3 doesn't. If you remember, that's the one that's in the uh, ABS plastic NEMA 1 enclosure and is designed for indoor use only in safe areas. For the FS7 and the FS10, we use the exact te same test lamp, but we put a, a little bit of a different screen over it. And so we have two different part numbers for it. One is the FS746-B that we use for FS7 detectors. And then the other one is the FS846-B that we use for the FS10 detectors. Again, these are th those detectors are designed for safe area applications. And so the, the test lamp doesn't need to be explosion proof for those. Uh, some other detector accessories. These are accessories that actually mount to the detector themselves. Uh, we have an air shield, and I've got the part number in parentheses there. And typically, these are for dirty environments. And you're going to be concerned with this uh, with the FS10 product the most, because you're going to have that detector in a booth where you're going to have aspirated powder and aspirated paint. And if that adheres to the window, it's going to block any energy from a fire, and the detector is going to fail at self-test. So basically, we put an air shield, and the air shield puts positive pressure in front of the lens, and it keeps the stuff that's overspray from actually coming in contact. It, it pushes it away from the lens so that we keep, keep our lens clean and, and uh, uh, maintain the integrity of our optical self-check. You can also mount that to detectors in outdoor applications. The only thing uh, that you need to know is that uh, the end user must supply dry shop air, you know, dry air to dry clean air to the device. I can't have it be wet air because then it's basically you're going to put moisture on the on the lens. Uh, I can't have dirty air because you're going to be putting the dirt on the lens and uh, if, you, if you think of the optical detector, it's, it's like I wear glasses. If my glasses get dirty, I have to take them off and clean them in order for me to see better. It's the same for the detector. If the detector's window gets dirty, um, that's the number one maintenance item is you have to go out and you have to clean the detector's window. Uh, for all of our detectors, they'll tell you when they're dirty. It's, they'll go into fault and they'll tell you when they're dirty. So. Uh, the second item we have on our list is a field of view restrictor. Now, the field of view restrictor is specifically designed to focus the detector onto the fire threat area. Um, you may have uh, a detector mounted in an area where you have more than one industrial facility. And so I want to monitor this process, but I don't want to go, I don't want to go into alarm because the adjacent facility has a flare stack that's going off, which is a real fire, and I can't stop my detector from seeing it because that's designed to see fires. So what you'll do is you'll put 
uh, a field of view restrictor on the detector and it, what it does is it focuses the detector's attention onto the primary threat area and ignores all of their outside influences. Um, I have a sunshade for use in excessive sunlight areas, uh, primarily the Middle East. Uh, we also use the sunshade to take the horizon off of the detector's field of view. The reason you want to take the horizon off of the detector's field of view, I'm looking at a broad spectrum of energy. The sun emits a broad spectrum of energy. I'm not going to alarm to the sun, but the sun does represent another IR source out there. And if the sunlight is shining onto the detector's face, it desensitizes my unit to fires that might be out there. It reduces my sensitivity. And so what I want to do is I want to take the sunlight off of the face of my detector. And I can either use the field of view restrictor or the sunshade to do that. It's not that I'm going to miss a fire, it's just that I'm going to take a little bit more time where that fire is going to need to be closer because I have to compensate for the presence of the sun. And the last uh, accessory we have on this page is the stainless steel swivel mount and it's the, the mounting bracket, that primary mounting bracket that we use for the, uh, for the FS24X, the FS20X, SS2, SS4, and FS10. Um, it uh, has two axes, has a horizontal and then a vertical axis, and you have 10 degree increments, plus or minus 90 on each one of those axes. And so you can mount the swivel mount and then basically position the detector so that it's looking uh, just about anywhere. And that brings us to our final section, which is the fire pick and the event log. <clears throat> now, uh, I've got in the upper left corner there, I've got a flight recorder that's there. And we took this, um, Honeywell Aerospace actually manufactures this particular flight recorder. And so I included in my presentation when I talk about fire pick and event log. Uh, don't worry, I'm not selling flight recorders, not in, in that respect. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I include it is because when you think of when a, a, a jet airline crashes or, or a, a commercial jet uh, or a private jet uh, when it crashes. Um, investigators always rush to the scene to recover the, the flight recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. And these two pieces of, of equipment are commonly referred to as the black box. Now, they use the information that they find within the black box to determine exactly why the aircraft crashed. Was it due to some mechanical failure, some instrument failure, or was it human error? And so they can go back and, and, and remedy that by doing some corrective work, uh, either, either better pilot training or uh, fixing a potential defective component or, or uh, instrument. And so it's, it's used to, to postulate the cause of the crash of the fire or the crash of the airplane. Okay, when we talk about fire pick and uh, event log, we're actually storing pre-alarm data for post-event analysis, much like the fire, the flight recorder does. And so, in respect, we're, we're I kind of am selling a flight recorder, I guess. <laughs> um, the fire pick is and it's something that's stored on the detector itself. It's in non-volatile flash memory. And uh, even if you pull power from the detector, you're not going to compromise the integrity of the data that's stored for at least 10 years. Uh, so uh, we can actually retrieve that data. And we have a, a resident PhD in Lincolnshire who can analyze the fire pick and, and give you reliable, or not reliable, but he can possibly postulate the cause for the fire. And so it's, it, it's, a, it's a good thing to have after an event occurs. And I pretty much just said everything that's on this slide. Okay. So a fire pick for the FSX detector is a single eight seconds of pre-alarm data that leads up to the declaration of a fire. Okay. And we can store six of these events at one time simultaneously. Once we have a seventh event, it overwrites the oldest event and it continues to work in that fashion. As new events come in, older events get written over so that you always have the last six events of, of the, 
that have occurred with that particular detector. Um, why would you need more than one? Well, uh, on the SS4 and the SS2 and the SS3, you only have one, and it's a two-second event. Um, but oftentimes what happens is, is if you have a detector that goes into alarm, uh, the operator says, hey, both red lights on that detector are in alarm. And the control room says, yeah, here's a test lamp. Why don't you go test it? And so he tests it, and it goes into alarm, and everything works fine. And so he comes back to the control room and says, okay, yeah, we, uh, the detector works. He says, okay, maybe we should send it back to the factory, see what they can tell us. Well, when he put the test lamp on it, he overwrit the old fire pick. And so that's why we have six fire picks, so that you can test it. Uh, a couple of times if you like to make sure you can get it to go into alarm. Um, that way when we when you download the fire picks and you send them to the factory we still have the one that's got the original event data in it. Um, in addition to that we have a 200 event event log that we keep. Any alarm, any fault, any power events they're all date and time stamp plus we store the detectors internal temperature and the uh, input voltage at the time that the event occurred. Okay, so how you how you get this is is by uh, you have an interface kit that has software, and so there's a cable, which is you can see the black cable there with the little black box. Looks like a USB connector on one end and uh, just a circular connector on the other. Um, off to the right there is an open lead and there are four leads and those are used to detect to the actual uh, detector itself. And so that's how you connect the detector cable, which is the FSIM, Fire Sentry Interface Module, to power and data terminals and you connect the USB adapter to a USB port on your laptop or your computer. Um, you plug the interface kit in, that's the round connector, it's a, it's a power plug actually, and allow it 10 seconds for its startup routine. On the FSX detectors, when it fires up, uh, all the LEDs will kind of turn on one in succession and uh, it'll go on like that for about 10 seconds and then you'll get your your single blink that tells you you're running. Um, there is a, a, a USB driver that needs to be installed and then there's of course the program. So when you look at a detector, here's the opening screen tells you the model number, tells you normal operation, uh, unless it's an alarm, it'll tell you an alarm, gives you the detector serial number, its digital address, and it will tell you what the internal temperature of the device is. Okay. Up at the top we have a setup menu, a detector menu, and a help menu. Now for the setup menu, you can select language, you can check the USB port operation, uh, supposed to display a diagram of the PC, but it doesn't really. Uh, gives you alarm sound choices, uh, alarm display choices, uh, tells you what the user settings are for that 10 position, that 8 position, and the rotary switch are on the back of the detector. And then uh, there's a select detector uh, menu. If you've got multiple devices connected to the RS-45 output, uh, you, you can use the digital address to select them. Um, the detector data menu gives you your 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 fun choices. Uh, real-time graph RTG mode uh, displays a real-time graph of all the sensor signals and we're going to see that just in a second here. Uh, it allows you to download the fire picks. You can either download the most recent or you can download all six. I always recommend downloading all six. Uh, snapshot you can use to gather real-time data. This is if you're working with the factory to determine, um, hey, I've got some some weird fuel here and it doesn't appear in your manual. I want to know if your detector can see it. And so we'll tell you, okay, uh, go put the detector in the snapshot mode and then light a fire with it and we'll gather information. You can send that snapshot back to us and we'll take a look at it. And then of course the event log that we've already talked about and you can uh, tell the uh, program to display the temperature either in degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Kelvin sorry, degrees centigrade or Celsius or degrees Kelvin. I don't know why you would want to do Kelvin, but it's there because the guy that wrote it was a science guy. So here's what the real-time graph looks like. And we have wideband DC, wideband AC, all kinds of signals over here representing the four, four regions that we look at. And this is 
everything's flat, so the, the detector's not seeing anything. This is what a test lamp would look like. I, I couldn't tell you that that's a test lamp, but there's somebody in Lincolnshire who can. And this is what a fire would look like. Now, this I do know, is if I look at this, and I see that we start out over here, everything's kind of flat, but everything, just about everything, except for maybe the green isn't moving so much, the green is the visible DC, isn't moving so much, but all this other stuff is, we got a lot of activity on it, right? And we go to the fire one, and wow, the green and the pink, particularly, are flat all the way through. And that's our two visible signals. And that's because the amount of visible energy that we're actually seeing with a real fire is very small when you compare it to the amount of infrared you're seeing. And so that's, uh, that's one way I can tell that this is not a test lamp, because a test lamp is basically a, a broad band of, of light. And uh, it's, it's, anyway, it has a lot of visible energy with it. So to download a fire pick, you'll just select fire pick, and you'll either select most recent or all, and it will download. It takes about 20 seconds to download a single fire pick. Um, if you want to do all six of them, it'll take you a couple of minutes, and you're done. This is what a fire pick looks like, right? Where, where, where we get to the right-hand side of the graph here, that's the point at which we declared an alarm. And these are the eight seconds that lead up to the declaration of that alarm. And with all this information, uh, the, they, can make a, they can possibly postulate the cause of your fire. You based on this. And so there's a save fire pick menu right here. And what you'll do is you'll click on that button. Let's click on that button. And that brings up a dialog box. And then typically I will save this fire pick, the serial number. Uh, it saves it as a comma separated value so that we can bring it into Excel. Uh, similarly, you can download the event log using the same method. It takes a couple of minutes to download the event log as it's 200 events long. And then you can save this as an RTF, a rich text formatted file. And it's every alarm, every fault, and every power reset that occurs. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I've got about 10 minutes here, and you guys can uh, ask away if you like. Or Tom, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. How about that, Tom? Yeah, no, that's fine, Charles. Um, yeah, if, you know, if there's any other questions that people have coming through. Um, is there anything else uh, maintenance-wise that everyone should be aware of with uh, with some of the equipment you mentioned, some of the you know, uh, glass needing to be cleaned occasionally? But as far as yeah. sensors, yeah. timing, what you know, what all is involved there? Okay, so with the um, you don't really need to uh, touch the sensors at all. It's just that, yeah. So I have you can see a hand here, and he, the the person is holding this. The, the module, we call it a puck because it's roughly the shape and size of a hockey puck, but he's not putting his hands on the sensor array, which are those, the six dots there that you can see right in the middle. Um, when you clean a detector, let me get to one of the, one of the, yeah, okay, so when you clean a detector, basically what you're going to do is you're going to take one of these screws, either this one or that one, it doesn't matter, and you're going to unscrew it and then swing that grill open like a gate so that you can get to the entire optical surface here. For this, it's a quartz window. Also, you can see there's a silver ring right here that goes along the outer edge. We use that to reflect the energy back onto the sensor array during its self-check. So while that grill is swung open like a gate, clean that back part of that ring so that you get a nice clean signal back. As far as maintenance, uh, visual inspection just to make sure that everything is, is secure and, uh, you know, uh, clean the windows when they, when they ask you to. Um, periodic testing, uh, we recommend an annual test. We recommend an annual end-to-end -end test of the complete fire protection system. Um, my recommendation is, is uh, if you've got gas detectors in your facility and you have to go out and bump test them or, or maybe calibrate them, Take the test lamp with you. It only takes about 10 seconds to put one of these things into alarm with the test lamp. So that's a that's a personal recommendation. That's not an official one. That's you're not going to find that in any manual. So 
still. And we got a pretty quiet crowd for the most part. Um, I guess if there's not many questions coming through, I guess we'll we'll wrap up. So um, appreciate your time, Charles. Uh, appreciate everybody not jumping on and spending some time with us. Um, again, we'll we do have this recorded. We'll uh, we'll put it up at Reiko.com on our training page. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can uh, you can email me at Tom at Reiko.com and I can forward it on to Charles. If you guys have any uh, particular projects or uh, applications that uh, you may want to discuss in further detail. Um, outside of that, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, keep your eyes open. We, uh, for our next webinar, will probably be sometime later next month. Um, and let's see, uh, slides will be available. Yes, the slides will be available as well. They'll also be on our website. Um, again, it's the Braco.com training page. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of your afternoon, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Thank you, Tom.